Hello students, welcome to Daras Online. My name is Idrissa Suya. I'm here to give you a revision lesson in history paper two. And our topic of today, my dear students, is the rise of capitalism in Europe. Uh, our previous lesson, my dear students, was the transition from feudalism to agri agrarian revolution. And also we looked at the rise of, uh, the rise of mercantilism. My dear students, the lesson of today, my dear students, we are going to look at the same topic of the rise of capitalism, but we are going to concentrate in subtopic, which is Africa's contribution to the development of capitalism in Europe and North America. And this is going to have two very important aspects. The first is condition which forced European mechanics to capture slaves from Africa to American Caribbeans. And the second aspect is to look at trading relations between Africa, Europe, and America during the era of mercantilism and their impact on Africa, Europe, and North America. This is what we are going to see, my dear students, today. But my dear students, this lesson of today has got some very important Two, ob uh, two objectives. The first objective is examining the conditions which forced the Europeans to, uh, Americans to capture slaves from Africa to America and the Caribbeans. That is the first objective. The second objective, my dear students, is analyzing the trading relations between Africa, Europe, uh, Africa, Europe, and America during the era of mercantilism and their impact on Africa, Europe, and North America. These, my dear students, are our two objectives. And make sure that at the end of our lesson of today, you are able to achieve these two objectives. My dear students, also we have got some questions. And make sure that these questions, you are able to attempt them at the end of our lesson. So, uh, you know, so while we are going on with our lesson, also try to look out for the answers for these two questions. The first question is examine the, you know, ex you know, examine the conditions which forced European settlers in America to obtain slaves from Africa in the 17th century. That was, the, you know, that is the first question. The second question is show how Africa was affected by triangular slave trading. These are our two questions, my dear students. So as I said, make sure that at the end of our lesson of today, you are able to attempt these questions, of course, together with some other questions which might also come from uh, this subtopic. My dear students, let's now go to uh, conditions which forced European Americans to capture slaves from Africa to America and the Caribbean. But before that, we have to look at the America that we know today. Majority of the black people that we see in America today, the, the so-called black Americans, not all of them, but most of them, they reached in America through what we call triangular trading. They reached the, in America through triangular trade. That means they were taken to North America and West Indies as the slaves. And as you can see, in America today, there is more than 30 million black people lives in America. In countries like Brazil, for instance, uh, you know, there is more than 90 million people who live in Brazil. And these people, of course, they are the mixture of black people and mulattoes. But those mulattoes, they're always identified as the black people, you see? So this is what we can see, let alone some other countries in the Caribbean. In Jamaica, for instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, you're going to, you're going to find quite a large number of black people. And those people who are living today in America, most of them, they reach there, uh, they reach there through, uh, you know, their ancestors reach there through triangular trading. So my dear students, those people who were taken to North America and West Indies, they were working in the plantation in mines as the slaves. And they worked there as the slaves uh, for quite a very long time. And remember, slave trading slavery has lasted for 400 years. So those people were producing in the plantation in mines for about 400 years. And they were producing gold, silver, and diamond in the, you know, in the mines, and also raw materials like uh, cotton, tobacco, rum, you know, I, I mean, and so on and so forth. The first black people to reach in America, the so-called today USA, the first black people to reach in USA, in fact, that first group of black Americans, they set their foot in America in 1619 in the state of Virginia, in the state of Virginia. 
This is the first group of black people who came to America. It was 1619 in the state of Virginia. And remember, this was the British colony. And so those slaves, they were brought there by the British after, you know, after the British ship has attacked the Portuguese ship, which was in fact scheduled to go to, uh, you know, to Veracruz in Mexico. And those people were taken and brought to Virginia. And that marked the beginning of slavery in the so-called United States of America. My dear students, as you can see, you know, as you can see, this is the place where the first group of black people were brought as the slaves. This is the place where the first black people were brought as the slaves. And this is the port at Point Comfort in Virginia where the first group of Africans set their foot in America as the slaves. Uh, you know, and if you go to that place today, you're going to see it this way. My dear students, after the 17th century, the Europeans, that means up to 1600, the Europeans, they were using slaves because you said it earlier that discoveries of North America and West Indies was done by Christopher Columbus in 1492 and 1504. But then you might ask some questions that if it was 1492 and 1504, this is when they discovered, and immediately after the discoveries, they established the plantations and mines. The question is, who were working in these plantations before the arrival of the blacks? Because we said the black people arrived in the so-called today United States in 1619, and this is 1504. So who were working in the plantations for that 100 years? So the point here is, before the arrival of the black to North America and West Indies, as we have seen, before the arrival of the black, of course, to North America and West, particularly to North America and United States, some Europeans were brought to work there. In fact, some settlers used to depend on labor uh, from Europe, and they were using two kinds of labor, particularly. They were using European slaves, and they were also using indentured labor. There were European slaves, and indentured labor. This is what they used to rely. This is what they used to rely. So as you can see, let's first see, how did they get those people to come to work in their plantations? The first way they got people to come to work in their plantations and mines, of course from Europe, remember, it was that some of the convicts were sent to North America and West Indies as part of saving their sentence. People who have committed some crime in Europe and sentenced to go to jail. Remember, when judge is giving you a sentence, sometimes they can say, you are going to save, let's say, five years in prison with hardy labor. So the so-called hardy labor is what made these people to be sold and go to work in America in the, in the Europeans, you know, in the European settlers' plantation. But remember, these people have to work for some time. After the end of their sentence, they'll have to be released and either decide to go back home to Europe or remain in, or remain in America. And another thing is, some people, of course, they went to America because they were running away from some poor political, economic, and, you know, and social conditions. They, were, they, they went to America to look for good pastures. And those people also, they found in America that there is nothing they can do but to work for the settlers for payment. That is the second way, uh, uh, the second way these European settlers used to recruit some people to work for them. The third group, it is those people who went to America as religious non-conformists, people who went to America because they rejected to agree the new faith. Remember, during that time, there was war going on in Europe between the Protestants and the Catholics. For instance, in German, that war has costed the life of a lot of people. About 8 million people were killed in German because of rejecting to accept, uh, you know, because of either rejected to accept the new faith or, other, or, or the others were forcing them not to convert and become Protestants and so on. So this is also, such people also went to America and work in the plantations. Another group are those people who went to America to work as indentured labor. I said it, indentured labor. Indentured labor, these are the people who work for contract people who work for contract. That means they can work for contract. After the end of their contract, they demand some payment and they were either paid in form of land or paid some money. So this is the way they used to recruit people to go to work in their plantations before the arrival of the black people. Due to some several changes which occurred in 17th centuries, that means 1600s, the white farmers and settlers in North America, they changed. 
they were looking for another alternative source of labor. Why another alternative source of labor? Of course, we shall come to see some reasons. And this is what we say, the transition from white form of unfreed labor to African form of labor. They transformed. Instead of using those European unfreed labor, they started to think of using African slave labor. What were the reasons for that transition? The first reason is industrial development in Europe, especially in Britain. Industrial development in Europe, especially Britain, remember, Britain was the first country in the world to undergo industrialize, and that was 1750, the second half of 18th century. And you know that industrialization, industrialization, my dear students, needs several things. One, they need market. Two, they need labor, cheap labor. Three, of course, they need raw materials and so on. So, these things the industries need, in fact, it was going contrary to, uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, it was against what was going on uh, during that time because people were taken from Europe to go to work in North America and West Indies, either as indentured labor or as people are running away from, uh, you know, from some political, social and unhealthy conditions. Or we said people who were taken there as the convict, people are being found guilty of after committing some crimes, saving their sentence. So... Europeans tend to discourage the process of taking people from Europe to North America because they feared that they are going to, uh, they are going to face a shortage of labor, people to work in their, uh, you know, in their infantry industries. They, f they, uh, you know, they feared that they are going to lose the market, which was so important. So it's because of industrial development in Europe, then, uh, it, uh, then it was totally discouraged to take people from Europe to go to work in America, either as indentured labor or maybe at the criminals, European slaves, or whatsoever. So that led to the shift from using European slaves to start to use uh, African slaves. The second is that white slave labor were not preferred because they could escape easily. White slave labor could escape easily. Imagine you have taken a group of, let's say, uh, 100 white slaves and they are working for you in your plantations. Because they are white, it was very easy for them to escape. Let's say somebody is in Boston and that person has escaped and he, he's trying to go to New York. Nobody is going to know that this is the slave on the run. Why? Because he's white and slave masters are white and those slaves are white. So you cannot distinguish them, especially if they have dressed pretty well. But what about the black? The black people is different because the black people, the moment they arrived in America, they were declared that they were slaves for life. That means they were slaves by birth. So whenever a black man move or woman move, then one will know that that is the slave on the run. That is the slave who is running away. So it was easy for the black people to be arrested and taken back to the owners. So for that case, they prefer to use African slaves than European slaves because African slaves always tended to remain in their locality. They could not move from one place to another uh, like the way European could. So for that case, this is why there was a shift from using European slaves to the use of African slaves. Another reason is in the middle of 17th century, most of the ruling class in Europe were afraid of underpopulation. They were afraid of underpopulation. Population was decreasing in Europe because of wars, because of famine, because of plague and some other diseases. In fact, there were a lot of wars. For instance, one of the wars, the, we call it the Second Thirty Years' War, because we know there is the First Thirty Years' War is the one which we've just said it, discussed it uh, in the previous lesson, a uh, war which was fought in Britain between 1455 to 1485, the war that we called, uh, you know, the war which was called a war of roses. So the Second Thirty Years' War was fought between 1618 to 1648, and this is the war which was fought in German. The war which was fought in German, uh, you know, when some people were trying to establish the Lutheran church and so on. So a lot of people died. In fact, they say the fatality were more than 12 times of the conflict between 1500 to 1619. So you can imagine that the conflict here has produced a lot of misery than ever before. Also, more than 8 million people said they died in that conflict and so on. So. Because of what we have said then, population was very important. Population was decreasing and they realized that under that time of mercantilism, population was very important. 
it was very important for many reasons. One, population was very important for military expansionism. During those days, the army was not considered by the kind of weapons that army possesses. Rather, it was considered by looking at the size of your army. How many soldiers do you have? So population was very important because the more people you have, the larger your army is likely to be. So you're going to win the war if you have got the, uh, you have got the large army. So that is one. Another thing is high population was needed for increasing tax collection. Tax collection was very important at that time. And for you to collect more tax, you need to have a lot of people. So a country which has got large number of people, that country was expected to become much more rich. The government was expected to become much more wealthy. Why? Because it is going to collect more tax than, the gov you know, than a country which has got a small number of population. But lastly, high population was also considered as important because it was a national prestige. A country which has got high population was also considered as a powerful country and so on and so forth. So it was a prestige for a country to have large population. So because of all this, then the governments of Europe started to discourage the transportation of Europeans from, from Europe to go to work in North America, either as slaves or as indentured labor, or even those people who were running away from some political and economic problems. It was very highly discouraged because they wanted population, their population at least to increase and not to decrease uh, so that they can achieve what I've just said. Another point, my dear students, is the booming capitalist agriculture in the Caribbean. Agriculture in the Caribbean was expanding. And as you can see, the more the expansion of agriculture, the more people to work in those plantations were needed. The more the expansion of agriculture, the more people to work in those plantations were needed. So it was obvious that with such expansion of agriculture for that 100 years, before they start to use the black slaves, eh? For that 100 years, before they start to use the black slaves, there were expansion of agriculture which was so large, which was so large, and it was obvious that the number of European slaves, indentured labor, and others coming from Europe, it was not enough. They have to look for another sources to supplement, uh, to supplement the shortage of labor. And the alternative, therefore, it was to come to Africa. People are producing cotton, wheat, tobacco, you know, plantation North America, sugar pro production, and so on. But also remember, they were mining. The more minings were opened, the more people ended to work in those mines. And it was obvious, therefore, that those people would not be enough. They have to look for another alternatives. Remember, you know, when you speak of criminals, the convicts who were brought to work as the slaves, that number is very limited because it depended on the number of people who are committing crime. So if people ha had not committed crime, and the, or if they had, but they were not found guilty, it's obvious that you're not go going to get people to come to work for you. So for that case, they have to look for another reliable alternative. And the reliable alternative, it was to take the black men and women from Africa to go to work in those plantations and mines. Another point is the white indentured labor were considered very expensive. The white indentured labor were considered very expensive. Why do we say they were very expensive? Because we say that at the end of their contract, these people were demanding payment, and they wanted to be paid in form of land. They, you know, I, I mean, uh, they wanted to be paid in form of land, and they highly discouraged to be paid money. They wanted land. So imagine, my dear students, that you know that settler, that European settler, let's say, has got 100 acres. 100 acres of land and you have employed 20 people to work for you as indentured labor and you gave them the contract you gave them the contract my dear students let's say of four years or let's say five years and the agreement is after the end of five years you are going to give them one acre each one acre each that means after five years you'll have to take uh, you have to take 20 acres out of your 100 acres and give them to this indentured labor. That means you are going to remain with eight, eight uh, you are going to remain with only eight acres, you see? And you hire them again, or another group of workers. You hire another group of indentured labor, let's say another 20. It means these people, after five years, they'll have to take another 20 acres. You remain with 60. Another group, 20 acres, you remain with 40. So if you keep on using this indentured labor, at the end, at the end, after 20 years, 20 years, you'll become landless. You'll become landless. So for that case, 
Those European settlers, therefore, they were very highly discouraged uh, using the indentured labor because indentured labor were always demanding land at the end of their contract, which was not good for them. So this also explains why there was a shift. But then, what about African slaves? What do they need? African slaves, they need nothing because they were free labor. The only cost you can incur it is to buy African slaves. After you have bought them, they'll work for you for the rest of their life. And your land will remain intact. No one is going to take your land. So you can see that's why there was a shift from using European indentured labor to the use of African slaves because they were very cheap. Another point is the issue of Red Indians. Because I know you might ask the questions that why should they come to look for people in Africa to work in their plantations in mine? Was that country, you know, was that North American West Indies empty? When they, you know, when they, I mean, I mean, was there not people living in that country? Of course, there are some people living there, and those people are Red Indians. But unfortunately, Red Indians were known to be lazy. They were lazy. They were lazy, and above all, they were arrogant. So imagine that a person is lazy and arrogant. That means even when they were forced to work, they could not work they have rather be killed. So in fact, a lot of them were killed by Europeans because they rejected to work in the European plantations and mines. And also these people are not immune to diseases. They are not immune to diseases brought by Europeans like smallpox, measles, and other sicknesses. So that means the diseases which are brought by Europeans, uh, they, killed a lot of, they killed a lot of Red Indians, but a lot of them also were killed by the Europeans. So you can see, what about the Africans? The Africans were very, very masculine. They were very tough. They were very masculine, very tough, and they could work. And above all, they were resistant to diseases. They were resistant to diseases. They could work for a long time. So if you try to compare the Red Indians and the Africans, then you can see the Africans could be more preferred than the Red Indians because African people, as I've said, they were very, uh, uh, you know, they were very tough, very masculine, very powerful, but above all, they were very highly resistant to diseases. So this is also another very important reason why there was a transition. Another point, my dear students, is the, uh, is the proximity between West Africa and North Africa and West Indies. The closeness between North Africa, uh, between West Africa and North America and West Indies. There is the closeness. There is the closeness. That means the distance between North America West Indies and Africa is very close compared to, let's say, one want to go, let's say, to take the slaves, let's say, from India or from East Africa. You could find it very far, my dear students. And as you can see, my dear students, this is the world map. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, it shows the distance between West Africa and some places in United States of America. You can see. And, it, it, you, know, it, uh, you know, it looks very close. It looks very close. Than, for instance, if they had taken, let's say, let's say from India and they bring it to America, that would have been very far. So this also can explain why there were such things. My dear students, let's now look at the trading relations between Africa and between Africa, Europe, and North America. Trading relation. What items were traded during the, uh, you know, during this triangular trading? The commodities and items which were obtained from Africa to Europe and North America included slaves. Slaves were obtained from different parts of Africa, particularly uh, in West Africa and Central Africa. That's where they used to take slaves. Gold and copper, ivory, animal skins were taken from West Africa and eastern part of Africa. And also, Europeans also gave textiles and wool to Africa in return for the slaves that would be shipped to their colonies in the America. So you can see this is the trading relations which existed and these are the commodities uh, which were taken. But also European gave American things like onions, olives, turnips, coffee, beans, peaches, pears, grains. Grains means wheat, rice, barley, you know, oats, livestock, cattle, sheep, pig and horses. This is what European gave to the America. And in return, the colonies in America, in fact, they gave to Europeans things like pumpkin, turkey, you know, pheasant, potatoes, tomato, corn, vanilla, cocoa, beans, peanut, uh, you know, pineapple, tobacco, and most important, sugar and spices. So you can see, this is, my dear students, uh, the trade relations which existed, uh, you know, between uh, these continents. 
My dear students, as, as you can see, this is the map which shows the trading relations between Africa, Europe, and uh, North America. You know, just look at this map and look at these arrows. These arrows, of course, they show the kind of commodities which were taken uh, from each continent and to each continent. Here, for instance, you can see Africa was supplying to Europe commodities such as gold, ivory, spice, and hardwood. This is what we are supplying to Europe. And look at what Europeans were brought to Africa. They brought to Africa guns, clothes, iron, and beer. Guns, clothes, iron, and beer. Just look. If you try to look at the value of what we are providing to them and what they are giving us back, in fact, there is totally and typical and equal exchange. Because we gave them the commodities of very high value and they gave us commodity of very low value. Just look. And from Africa also to North America and West Indies, Africa was exporting slaves. As you can see, the slaves were not taken, they were not taken to Europe. They were going through in what they called a middle passage. They were going through this way which they called it a middle passage. And they could go to, you know, to the Caribbeans, later supplied to North America and West Indies. As you can see, my dear students, you know, from Europe, I, I mean from Europe to North America, they were taking manufactured, you know, manufactured goods and they were exported from these three places in London, in Bristol, in, in Liverpool, and they could go to North America, manufactured goods and luxurious goods. And from North America, uh, from North America and, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and West Indies, they could take wild oil, lumber, furs, rice, silk, indigo, tobacco, sugar, molasses and wood. These, of course, were transported from New World to go to Europe, and these are the raw materials. But my dear students, ask yourself a question. Who were the producers of these raw materials? In fact, they were African slaves. So you can see how Africans have contributed to the development of capitalism and industrial, you know, uh, you know, and industrialization, not only in America, but also in Europe. And this can be proved by raw materials which were transported from North America and West Indies to go to Europe. Remember, we shall come to see it later. One among the factors for industrialization of Europe, it is the abundant supply of raw materials. But then who were the producers of that raw materials? Were the African slaves who were producing raw materials in North America and West Indies at a very cheaper cost. My dear students, also as you can imagine, uh, you know, you can imagine they were taking other things like fish, livestock, flour, you know, and lumber from this island in the Caribbean. So Europeans were, one can say at that time, for 400 years, they were plundering, uh, you know, they were plundering other continents, including Africa, uh, uh, you know, including Africa, North America, and West Indies. My dear students, let's now look at this other map, the pattern of transatlantic slave trading. This is the pattern of transatlantic slave trading. The aim here, my dear students, is to show where the slave came from. Majority of the slaves, as you can see, they were taken from this part which is shaded, this part. They were taken from Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon, Congo Republic, you know, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, and Angola, you see? Here is where people were taken. And some other few were taken from Mozambique. But those taken from Mozambique, my dear students, they were not taken direct to go to North America and West Indies. Only some few, majority of them, my dear students, they were taken to work in Madagascar, in Reunion, and, uh, you know, Madagascar and, you know, Madagascar and Reunion, which, of course, were the French colonies and so on. So the number of people taken from Africa, as you can see, 35% were taken to South America, and most of them were taken to Brazil. And also, 60% were taken to West Indies, and 5% to United States. But remember, slaves who were taken to West Indies, they were later distributed or resold to North America and West Indies. They were later resold to North America. That means to United States of America and so on. So this is the way it was, and this is how, uh, you know, this is how it is. And the main source of slaves, as we have mentioned, uh, they are these countries which are painted with this color and so on and so forth. My dear students, these are the slaves. These are the, you know, this is the picture uh, that shows African slaves in America carrying cotton from the cotton farms, as you can see. And this was the early time of slavery in America. 
after the Africans have arrived in America and they start to work in the plantations as slaves. My dear students, after looking at that, let us now look at the, uh, the impact of trade relations on Africa, Europe, and North America. That the three, uh, you know, uh, the trade between the three continents had political, social, and economic effects to all continents, though, of course, we say they differed. For European and North America, it was development, for, but for the Africans, it was an development. The first impact of these trade relations on Europe is, uh, is industrialization. Industrialization, because we know that uh, these trade relations, first of all, has contributed to uh, production of abundance raw materials. A lot of raw materials were produced. As we said earlier, raw materials were produced by African slaves who used to produce raw materials in plantations and mines. A lot of raw materials were produced. And that is one. But also industrialization was made possible by African labor who worked in the plantations. You know, African labor who work in the plantations, as we have said, to produce raw materials at a cheaper cost. But also there is this issue of expansion of market. Expansion of market. Market has expanded because those people who went to North America and West Indies, they in fact became market. Even though we know the slaves cannot buy on their own because they don't have purchasing power, but it's a fact that uh, you know, their slave masters were buying some of the items for them. So industrialization is one of the impact of these relations. Most important through raw materials which was produced by uh, African slaves. Another impact of these trade relations, my dear students, is that it led to the rise of European mercantile class. The rise of European mercantile class. There was the rise of European mercantile class. Remember we mentioned about the rise of the group of European class which, were, uh, which was called the commercial bourgeoisie class. These people, of course, they obtained their money. They obtained their money through trading. They obtained their money through, uh, you know, I mean, through these trade relations. A lot of people became rich by selling African slaves. A lot of people became rich by traveling to, to go to different parts of the world to look for uh, some precious metal and so on and so forth. So it led to the rise of uh, merchant class. Another point is it contributed to the rise and expansion of financial institutions like banking and insurance company. I've just finished to say, my, my dear students, that there are some two very important banks which rose in England. And one of the reasons why had they, uh, why had they rose in England, uh, we said, is because of their owners participating in slave trading. Their owners participating in slave trading. Uh, you know, I, I mean, we are talking of people like... Uh, David Buckley and Alexander Buckley. David and Alexander Buckley, the two brothers. These people, of course, they used to be the slave traders in Liverpool market. And they obtained money after selling some Africans in Liverpool market. And that money, they used it as the capital to establish the chain of banks, banks which were called Buckley banks. And my dear students, you know the Buckley banks. They're existing to today. So and the money which was used to establish such bank was obtained from those pe two people who were engaging in slave trading at the Liverpool market. Another example is the Leod Bank of London. The Leod Bank of London, just like Barclay Bank, all those these people got the money to establish their bank after engaging in the slave trade, uh, you know, in England. So you can see, my dear students, the rise and expansion of financial institutions like banking and insurance company also is one of the impact of the trade relations which developed between Europe, America, and Africa. Another point is it contributed to the introduction of monetary system contributed to the introduction of monetary system. My dear students, I've said it already. You can look back to the establishment of International Bank of England. International establishment of International of, uh, Bank of England in 1696. This bank, uh, you, know, you know, one of the reasons why this bank was established is because of the money which, was being, which has been, uh, uh, you know, obtained from different parts of the world through these trade relations. These people, of course, they were moving around the world to look for gold and silver. So large accumulation of that gold and silver has contributed to the establishment of that International Bank of England. But most important also, we have also spoken about other things like uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, we have said about other things like uh, development of Amsterdam as one of the inland financial inland financial city. Amsterdam was developed as one of the inland financial city. According to Walter Rodney, it was not common in Europe at that time an inland town to develop as a financial town, but Amsterdam did. Why? It's because of a lot of gold which was found from different parts of the world, including Africa. But moreover, in England also they introduced a coin which was called the Guinea coin, which was called the Guinea coin. And this coin was used in England with this name of Guinea coin because this coin was obtained from Republic of Guinea in West Africa. So you can imagine, they knew how to make coin after they lent it from Africa, after they saw the coin in Africa and they took it and used it in their country. So my dear students, as you can see, uh, it contributed to the introduction of monetary system uh, in Europe. Another thing is it led to the growth and expansion of some seaports. Of course, we have said about this. We mentioned Bristol, we mentioned Liverpool. Also, there is uh, Bordeaux. Also, we mentioned Nantes, Sevilla, and so on in Spain. This also is one of the impact of the trade relations uh, on Europe. Another trade relation on Europe is it was a major source of European accumulation of capital. I said it earlier. One can ask you a question. Where did these people get money to establish their industries? They got that money because of these trade relations. Remember, these trade relations was an, it was characterized by an equal exchange, an equal exchange in favor of Europeans. We said it and I, sh I, I, I we said it and I already shown you some examples how exchange was unequal. It operated in favor of the Europeans. The Europeans were getting a lot and Africans and people of the other continents were getting nothing. So this also, my dear students, is one among the very important uh, things which has contributed to uh, the trade relations. But moreover, regarding this issue of trade, uh, you know, unequal exchange, my dear students, uh, for 400 years, Europeans were making a lot of profit. But what about people of the other continents? They were getting nothing. They were getting nothing. So this is also uh, what we can say regarding uh, the trade relations between these three continents and how Europe was, uh, w was benefited by that trade relations. Another thing, my dear students, is the, it stimulated the growth of science and technology. It stimulated the growth of science and technology. We have seen already how has it stimulated the development of science and technology, particularly the improvement of marine technology, the improvement of marine technology. Marine, of course, we are talking of uh, the improvement of shipbuilding, uh, you know, the improvement of sea transportation, and that one was caused by uh, these trade relations because these people have to travel to come to Africa to take slaves and so on. But also, uh, in 1700s, in 1700s, in England, for instance, they, used, they, were using, they were using triangular trade as the, areas of train, you know, as the areas of training their new sailors. And to know whether somebody is qualified or not, somebody is qualified as a sailor or not, one has to be given a ship, at least to ride that ship from America to Africa twice or thrice, and then you can be declared qualified as a captain, you see? So they used the triangular, I mean, they used the triangular slave trade. They used the slaves which used to carry African slaves as their training ground, a ground of training their new sailors, you see? So that contributed to the rise and expansion of European marine technology. So there was the growth of technology because of this triangular trade. But also I said earlier, uh, marine technology was associated also with the development of iron industries, metallurgy industries, and so on. My dear students, after looking at the impact of that trade relation on Europe, let us now look at the impact of trade relation on North America. How North America was affected by these trade relations? The first thing is development of agriculture, especially, uh, especially in the southern state. There was development of agriculture, especially in the southern state. Remember, the southern states of the United States of America, they are typical 
agricultural state, typical agricultural state, where people are producing different kinds of crops. And there were development of agriculture in this area, which of course we'll see in the next point, it inspired development of industries in the, in, in the northern part of the United States of America. The millions of black slaves who were working in the southern states where they were, you know, where they were working in the plantations in the southern states as slaves. Another thing is industrialization of United States of America. Just as I've said, the northern part of the United States became industrialized. It became industrialized because of raw materials which was produced by the uh, southern states where, black, uh, where African slaves were working in those plantations. So there, there are two things which can be regarded uh, that they can go together. There is development of agriculture and industrialization. Remember, industrialization, particularly if you're talking of industrialization which is related with the agricultural raw materials, uh, then you can see uh, that uh, the agriculture sector has got a very much contribution to the industrialization of the northern part of the United States of America. Another thing is the rise and development of financial institutions, just like what we saw in Europe. Financial institutions were developed. Remember at that time, gold and silver were regarded as medium of exchange, and people were producing gold. A lot of people were producing gold. Gold was produced in different mines in the United States, particularly we said in California, for instance. There was what is called the gold rush, which was produced in California. But also in southern part of, you know, in, uh, in South America, people were producing silver. Also, gold was produced also in Brazil. So and they were medium of exchange, remember. So there was the rise in development of financial institutions. The more gold was produced, the more the need of having a place to keep those gold. So that led to the establishment of banking system and so on. Another thing is it led to the emergence of black Americans and mulattoes. The people who are called today the black Americans, in fact, those people would have never been existi existing in America today if it wasn't that trade relations. They were taken there uh, through triangular trading. You know, they didn't go there on their own. They didn't go there for picnic. In fact, they went there after being forced to go there to work in the plantations as slaves. And that, remember, we said has lasted for 400 years. So the black people, black men and women and children, they went to North America and West Indies to work uh, in the plant. They were taken North America and West Indies to work in the plantations. But remember here, we're also talking about mulattoes. Mulattoes, they're the people of mixture, people who, mix, who have got mixed the blood of the Europeans and the blacks, those people also considered to be, uh, I mean, to be part of the black people because they have got the, uh, they have got the blood of the black people and so on. So that is also another thing. But all in all, my dear students, this led to the increase in population of that region of North America and West Indies. You can take, for instance, the state like Virginia, for instance, or South Carolina and North Carolina. Their population was very small before the arrival of the black people. But after black people had arrived in those states, then population had kept on increasing, had kept on increasing. And later, the number of black people, in fact, they outnumbered the people of other race, you can see. So that is another very important impact of that trade relations. Another thing is it is stimulated development of, it is stimulated the development of infrastructures in North America, especially in USA. Infrastructures have to be developed, especially when you have established the farms, when you've established the activities, mines, and so on, in the whole of the United States, in the whole of North America. In fact, you'll have to establish also some infrastructures to join those areas, at least to make possible transportation of raw materials, transportation of minerals from one area to another. So the opening up of those areas economically, it has to be followed by the establishment of infrastructures to join those areas with the urban areas. So it inspired the development of infrastructures, as I just finished to say. So those, my dear students, are the impact of the trade relations between these three continents on America. Let's now very quickly look at the impact of trade relations on Africa, how Africa was affected. Just as what I said, my dear students, Africa was affected negatively. So things like uh, scientific and technological stagnations, African science and technology has to remain stagnant. Why? Because of the importation of European ready-made goods. Some goods were brought to Europe, to Africa, like clothes and others. And those goods which were brought to Africa, in fact, they contributed to the dying of African industries. But also we are speaking about the decline of African intra-trade system. African intra-trade system also has to collapse. 
Why? Because of the changing of the trade pattern. Another thing is introduction of new crops. Some new crops were introduced to Africa. Another thing, my dear students, is exploitation of African resources. Of course, we have seen how African resources were exploited. But much more, the rise and fall of some states. Some states have to collapse, uh, have to collapse, as we have seen, especially those states which used to depend uh, on inter-trade system, like Trans-Sahara Trade, they collapsed. And some new roles, especially those trade which started to rely on triangular trade. And another thing is, uh, it exposed Africa to the imperialists to pave a way to colonization. Africa continent was exposed to the imperialists and so paved a way to colonization. Through these trade relations, the Europeans, they were able to know Africa, to know about the resources of Africa, to know about the, uh, you know, to know about the strength of African societies and states. So that became very simple for these people later to come and colonize Africa. Let's look at the social impact on trade relations in Africa. Of course, we have got the population. We have said it already. A lot of African people, in fact, they disappeared from Africa. The number differed. If you look at Dubohen, he says 30 to 40 million. But other, of course, they can put that number much more higher or less. The outbreak of famine because of that situation of slave trade and slavery, many people have to remain in doing instead of producing. Also, you can speak of destruction of African culture. Total way of life of African people was destroyed because of importation of some of the European items and goods, which changed the African culture and so on. Also, we talk about the spread of some diseases like smallpox, uh, bilharzia, chorella, syphilis. All these diseases were brought by Europeans. Another thing is separation of African families. African people who were living together in peace and harmony. They were separated because of slave trade and slavery. Some Africans were taken and sold as the slaves and they left their loved one back in Africa and in fact they never met them. This can be witnessed, my dear, my dear students, if you go to Senegal in a place called Igori, that is exactly where African people uh, who were in part of Dakar could give a farewell to their fellow who were taken to uh, to North America and West Indies to work in the plantations and they knew after you go to Gori then it's obvious that they will never see them again. So this is exactly also what happened. Also there is a spread of Christianity. We said it earlier that Christian religion was introduced through these trade relations. Uh, my dear students, let's now look at the contribution of labor to the uh, Africa, slave labor to development of capitalism in Europe and North America. The first is slave produced raw materials, of course, we have seen about it. They worked in the mines to produce gold and silver. Of course, we have seen, and that led to financial development of financial institutions. Slave participated in the American War of Independence, of 70, which started in 1726, and the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865. Also, they contributed to the development of agriculture in the southern state. We have said about it. Also, they contributed to increase in population in USA. And finally, they later, uh, later after abolition of slave trade, they became cheap labor and market for European goods. My dear students, let us just break for a while be back. Welcome back, my students. After we have gone through our lesson of today, my dear students, now I'm quite sure that you can attempt these questions. And the first question was, examine the conditions which forced European settlers in America to obtain slave from Africa uh, in the 17th century. My dear students, I know now you have the answers to this question. Of course, we have gone through them and you have the answers. The second question is, show how Africa was affected by triangular trade. Of course, we have mentioned social, political and economic impact and how Africa was affected by this triangular trade. My dear students, these questions, as I said, they are very simple and I know you have the answers. So for now, my dear students, let's end here and let's meet in another lesson. Thank you for watching and listening. Goodbye.